Right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, a big thank you to the BioLinks team for having us um, to join their brilliant series of talks. Uh, my name is Lauren Kennedy, and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Officer for a project called Making a Buzz for the Coast, which is led by Bumblebee Conservation Trust. I'm joined today by two of our conservation officers as well, which will be, they'll be helping me out um, in the question and answer session. So we have Kate physics Dairy with us. Give us a hello, Kate. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Matching t-shirts. And uh, Bex Cartwright as well. If you can, Bex, give us a hello. Hello, hopefully not too robotic. That's great, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Um, so as a project, we are really lucky to be uh, to receive funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. So for everyone who buys lottery tickets, your that money goes to great causes and we're very lucky to be one of them. Uh, but we also work with lots of different organisations, councils and charities, which you can see along the bottom of that slide. We are um, a massive collaboration project as our project area is a really large one, which you'll see in a second. And we are extremely keen to have as positive an impact as possible for bumblebees and conservation across the coast. So working together is the best way to do that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our project and the trust and then we will take a little look at bumblebee ecology. So looking at the life cycle of our bumblebees, where they like to nest, what they get up to in the summer. And then we'll dip our toes into bumblebee ID. So we'll look at some of the key features that you need to get started and point you in the direction of loads of great resources um, that will hope, hopefully get you recording bumblebees um, and then we'll take a look at a very special bumblebee that's extremely rare and um, an important species for our project. So Bumblebee Conservation Trust is the, is the lead on the Making Buzz for the Coast project. We are still a small charity founded in 2006 and we have projects all over the UK. Um, starting up in the very north of Scotland, where we have uh, staff working to conserve the great yellow bumblebee, um, now only found in the very north of Scotland. That bumble does what it says on the tin, it is big and yellow, uh, very difficult to miss and if you're ever up that way, worth looking for. We have a project in the Peak District, pollinating the peak, conserving the brilliant bilberry bumblebee, we have projects in West Wales, we have West Country Buzz in the Southwest, and in Kent, we have a, another project that we work closely with, uh, run by Dr. Nikki Gammons, which was the short haired reintroduction project. So we all work towards the same goal, which is conserving our bumblebees and spreading the love for, for bumbles and, and looking out for them. So the Making Buzz for the Coast project, um, and this is our brilliant team based in North Kent. So a quick intro running um, left to right. We have Emma Lansdale, our project manager. We have Rosie Erica, our B Roads officer. Then we have Bex Cartwright and Kate physics Derry that I introduced, myself, and then Vonda Lowe on the far right, our admin and finance officer. And not in this picture, we have Maureen Rainey, who delivers our Wild About, uh, the Wild About Gardens um, award scheme with Kent Wildlife Trust. And each year we've taken on three trainees, um, which are a big part of what we do, um, creating and developing skills. Uh, so that's always a great thing. But what is our project and, and where do we work? So as I mentioned before, our project area is a, is a really large one. So working with others is extremely important. We work Dartford all the way to Deal. It's about 135 miles of very stunning coastline. We can't complain, it's gorgeous. And we uh, work with lots of different landowners across that stretch, including our partners. And the main aim of our project is to create and restore excellent habitat for bumblebees. This of course has a knock on positive impact for other pollinators and lots of other wildlife as well. Along the way, we hope to um, inspire others with our passion for bumblebees and pollinators 
to encourage people to take action, whether it's in their local area, whether it's joining us um, on activities uh, for the project, or whether it's just um, adding bumblebee flowers to your garden. The project itself is three years long, and we've had two years of delivery already. So 2020 is actually our final year. So as you can imagine, this year looks very different to that of last year and to what we we thought the year would be. But nevertheless, we are still trying to engage with as many people as we can. And we stay very close to our community of volunteers and just try to um, engage in a different way, usually via Zoom. In our first two years of our project, 2018 and 2019, we achieved a huge amount towards our project aims of, of creating and restoring habitat. By working with different landowners, some private, some council, some charities, um, Kate and Bex have provided incredible bespoke land management advice to help create that brilliant bumblebee habitat. So whether that's foraging habitat, so uh, putting in the food that they need, their favourite flowers, and also making sure there's nesting habitat as well. Uh, our Bee Roads officer, uh, Rosie Erica, has been working with Kent County Council and Swale Borough Council with our Bee Roads initiative. So where possible, changing how some road verges are cut, leaving them to flower longer, increasing their flower diversity, and even creating um, bee banks, so great nesting sites for solitary bees where we can. None of what we do is, would be possible without our community of volunteers though. We are um, a small team and it's a huge area and it's thanks to a huge team of about 90 now volunteers across the coast that we've been able to achieve all that we have so far and hope to continue to do. Um, and they get involved with everything from practical conservation, raking, seed sowing, plug planting, to helping us with surveys and public engagement as well. That's what's allowed us to have the impact that we have then um, over the two years. We do lots of volunteer training, but we also run ID courses for the general public. So spreading that bumblebee knowledge to encourage people to get involved with recording uh, the bumblebees they see in their garden or in their local patch. Uh, but we've also done a lot of engagement across uh, the coast over the two years at talks, at workshops, um, lots of different types of events and guided walks and encouraging people to get involved in gardening as well. And, we've, and we award a, a garden with the best buzz through Kent Wildlife Trust's Wild About Garden Scheme. So over the last two years to date, we've We've engaged with over 10,000 people across Kent talking about our brilliant bumblebees. You think we'd be bored, but we're definitely not. So I mentioned that the Trust has projects all over the UK. And um, Kent is one of the Making Buzz for the Coast project is one of the newest. And it's a no brainer why we chose Kent. It's such an incredibly diverse county for bumblebees. So in the UK, we get 24 different species of bumblebee and 22 of those have been recorded in Kent. So it's a county with just an incredible diversity. Some of those species are extremely rare. There's some photos along the bottom of the slide there, some of the rarest. Um, and one in particular, which I'll um, expand upon later. Um, Kent is a really popular county for bumblebees um, because of the lovely warmer climate but also the sheer variety of habitat there's so many different areas and and habitat availability that it means there's a bit of something for for all of our bees so it's uh, it's not a surprise that we find so many there's such an intrinsic link as well between this area and of course the pollination service that our bumblebees provide free of charge and it's so important, not just to our economy, economy but to livelihoods and, and the natural heritage of the county through orchards and other agricultural crops. But bumblebees, as I'm sure most of you are aware, aren't the only type of bee that we get in the UK. 
So of course on the left hand side we have there our honeybee which is probably the most well known bee in the UK and one that we get the most questions about. We have just one species of honeybee in the UK and we have a very active honeybee keeping community all across the UK. This is our only bee that produces honey and creates this lovely honeycomb structure, very neat and tidy. Its life cycle is a little longer than that of our bumblebees, so the honey that they produce is their food store that takes them through the winter, which isn't something that we see for our other bees. So uh, the hive itself is very different and much larger. Our other type of bee on the right hand side is, um, is often overlooked which is really surprising when you find out that there are over 250 types of this bee which and they're all solitary bees so these are hugely varied in their shape color and size definitely harder to identify and as the name suggests they live a solitary lifestyle so the females each create their own nest um, alone and they like to they're the ones that love to use these bee boxes or bee hotels as they're coined um, and you'll get a lot of activity especially this time of year with a lot of nest building if you've got these in your garden they're great to watch um, if you haven't do consider putting one in because they provide a great nesting site for a range of solitary bees they are probably the unsung heroes in in pollination as they do an incredible job, they're extremely effective pollinators. But of course, what we've come for today, what we've all turned up for are our brilliant bumblebees. These are some of a handful of the most common bumblebees that, that we see in the UK, and that will definitely be visiting your gardens and local green space, especially if there's flowers available for them. We have, as I mentioned, 24 different species in the UK, and they might be more varied than you initially thought. Um, as I mentioned, these are the most common, and I'll be using a lot of these as examples throughout the talk uh, to illustrate certain ID features. And they're just a really good uh, handful of species to get started with in ID, as they will definitely regularly visit your gardens. Bumblebees are such incredible pollinators and are intrinsic to our ecosystems not just pollinating the plants in your garden that provide wonderful color and food for for other species but also a lot of the food that we rely on um, crops and orchards etc um, so they are just incredibly important so what does the life of a bumblebee look like? What do they get up to throughout the year? So a year in the life of a bumblebee looks a little bit like this. So we start our journey in the top left hand corner with our queen bumblebee in a hibernating state. So this cycle is so much shorter than that of a honeybee for example and our queen lives for about a year and most of that time she spends in this hibernating state through the winter. So she hibernates there burrowed into some loose soil, you might find some queens if you're doing some winter gardening um, and she remains there through the winter with no food and no bees with her, she's completely alone. It's only when you, when that queen gets that cue from that warmer weather as spring hits do we see our queens emerging? Of course, that's become earlier and earlier, what with our changing climate and warmer winters. When our queens emerge, they need to do a lot of feeding. So you can imagine she spent all of that time in that hibernating state, she needs to replenish that energy. So having um, food available at that time of year is extremely important. So as I go around this, I'm going to reveal a few plants that are really good for bumblebees at this at each stage in their life cycle. But it's by no means the only plants. These are just two or very few examples. The list is endless. So if you'd like more information on plants that are great for bumblebees, do have a look on our website. 
and we have an app called Be Kind that can help you to increase the, the bumblebee score of your garden, so do take a look. For example, early in the season, plants like Langworth, Pulmonaria, are brilliant forage for bumblebees, as is um, willows, hawthorn and blackthorn. And dandelions are incredibly important food plants early in the season, not just for bumblebees, um, but for lots of other pollinators, including solitary bees. So once our queen has done a lot of feeding and is feeling replenished, she starts to look for the perfect nest spot. So most of our bumblebees will nest underground. They can't create a cavity themselves, so they have to nest where something has been before. They love um, old rodent holes, for example, uh, but they are opportunistic, so they'll take advantage of any cavity that looks about the right size. That could be under your shed or in your compost bin. We get lots of calls about compost bins. Um, some of our bumblebees like to nest in long grass, so they'll um, wiggle their way into the centre of a tussock of grass and create their nest in there. And we have a species called the tree bumblebee, and as the name suggests, it loves hollows in trees, so old woodpecker holes. Um, and they'll also use uh, bird boxes that you put up in your garden. So you might have um, one of those in your, in your garden this year. We get a lot of calls about um, tree bumblebee nests. So when she's found the perfect spot, then the queen works really hard to get the nest started. She starts to create these wax pots and the structure of her nest, which as you can see, looks different to that of a honeybee. She does a lot of food collecting back and forth um, in order to get a good little food stock in order to lay her first brood of workers. It's only when those workers hatch and emerge as adults does the queen then stay within the nest. So all of the workers um, that are created are all female and once, that, once those first batch of workers have been released, um, the queen stays in the nest and the workers then take on that role of collecting food for the nest. So this starts to take us into summer where there are a huge list of, of plants that are great for bees. Um, some of those are th things like lavender and foxgloves provide a, a brilliant meal for our bumblebees. So as we move into the summer, the nest of our, our bumblebees is beginning to change. So the nest length for our bumblebees can range between two to five months, depending on the species. So some are very short indeed. Um, it's only when the nest starts to reach sort of maximum capacity, as it were, coming towards the end of its cycle, does the workers start to feed up larva to become queens. So you have to be fed over a certain amount to become a queen. And it's at that point that the queen herself is laying male eggs. So when the males hatch, they disperse straight away um, in the hope of going forth and mating with the queen of another nest. And it's when the new queens are ready to emerge from the nest that the old queen, the one that set the nest up, and all of her workers are reaching the end of their life cycle. Um, and that nest has, has come to an end. So usually at this time, great flowers to have are things like sunflowers and verbenas that flower quite late into the year that can provide the fuel for our new queens that are out exploring and our males that are in the search for a queen. Um, these will mate and then if there's time in the season for that queen to create a nest she will. If not then she will do a bit of feeding and then find herself a hibernation spot. So most of our species uh, will hibernate through the winter. However, very recently, we have found that our buff tail bumblebee in particular, our most, one of our most common, has now taken to a winter cycle, a winter nest cycle, because it's often because it's milder and that there are some foods available. So having things like mahonia and winter heather, so some lovely um, colder month color in your garden, can provide forage for us buff tail bumblebees that take a punt and take a risk on a nest through the winter. 
So as I've mentioned there, a little bit about how the nest structure works, and I've talked about queens, workers and males. This is often referred to as caste, uh, being a queen, a worker or a male. And for most of our, for a huge proportion of our bumblebees, the, all of these casts have the same color pattern. So um, we have to tell them apart using size and other features. So for example, our queens of our um, species that have the same color pattern, our queens are larger, and then the workers and the males are about two thirds or half of the size of the queen. So it's during the first part of the season, so the last couple of months, that you see a lot of queens flying. They're so much larger and easier to spot. And then you start to see smaller versions of them collecting pollen and nectar to our workers and then the males slightly later. But there are some examples of some species in which the casts have different colour patterns, which is great for us in terms of ID. It means that we are, are able to tell them apart slightly easier. So one of those that you'll see a lot of at the moment is the early bumblebee. Um, it gets its name not so much because it's the earliest to emerge, but they're very quick at finishing that first nest cycle. So there are males out and about in force now and have been for, for a few weeks. So for this species, for example, you can see that our queens, workers and males all look a little bit different. And that's um, really handy when it comes to ID. So our queen, this species is, is a small one, it's the smallest we get. And we have um, a lovely yellow collar band on the thorax. So this first section of our bumblebee is called the thorax. And this second section is the abdomen. So we've got a collar band there, a yellow band on the, on the abdomen and a little orange red tail. The workers then, which are smaller than our queen, often lack that second yellow band. And the males have a lot of yellow. They're like a little pom-pom ball of yellow with a really thick collar and a lovely bright yellow face as well. They're, they're really easy to spot, really lovely looking. It's also worth noting that it is only our females, so that's workers and queens, that can collect pollen. And they do that by squishing pollen and nectar together and creating these what we call pollen baskets on their hind legs. So you know you've got female uh, of a social bumblebee, of a nest builder, when you've got these lovely pollen baskets on the back legs. But not all of our bumblebees create a nest. So out of our 24 bumblebee species, six of them are called cuckoo bumblebees. Um, as the name suggests, they are much like the bird in that they lay their eggs in the nest of a social bumblebee. So they lay their eggs in, um, in a, within the nest of a, a species that, that creates one. So um, we often see similar traits in identification of our cuckoos that you can use to, 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 to let you know if you might have a cuckoo bumblebee. So we don't have a queen and worker system for these species. As they don't need to create a nest, we have just males and females. So the female will sneak in to the nest of another bumblebee and lay her eggs in there and leave them to rear those eggs. Um, some of the features to look out for is that our cuckoos tend to have overall a darker appearance. So they are built slightly differently. They have an extra layer of chitin on their exoskeletons. It's kind of like an armor. It means they often appear a bit bulkier um, and they're a little bit stronger. So kind of built for a fight. And that often means that the hairs appear sparser, so they might just look a little bit shinier where you can see that exoskeleton coming through. It's important to note as well that any colour on bumblebees is only on the hairs. Um, so underneath, all of our bumblebees have a black exoskeleton. 
So in general, they do appear darker. Some retain this yellow collar band, but then often don't have um, additional bands on the abdomen and bottom of the thorax. That's not all, but just um, in general. We also have um, the lack, there's a lack of pollen baskets. So because they don't create a nest, they don't need to collect pollen and nectar. So they will never have those lumps of food on their back legs. And because of that, they have quite hairy back legs. So they're not able to collect that food. Whereas our um, females that can collect have a lovely shiny patch, which I'll show you um, in a few slides. And they often have, our cuckoos often have smoky or very dark wings, which is another um, good factor to look at. This species that I've used as an example is by far the one that I come across the most. It's called the southern cuckoo, or Bombus vestalis, and it uses the buff tail bumblebee, so again, a very common species, as its preferred host. So you'll definitely get this a lot in gardens and in, in green spaces. It has this collar, then it's all black until you reach the tail, and it has it's hard to see in this photo, but two yellow little flashes either side of its white tail. Um, often the females appear really large and bulky and definitely one to look out for. So as I mentioned, we're going to take a very, um, a very quick look into Bumblebee ID and getting started. So I thought the best thing to do would be to look at some of the features that are best to focus on if you're getting started and then take a look at some other interesting factors and parts of our bumblebees that either help us to identify to species or help us figure out if we have a queen worker or a male. So the first two points here are the best to get started with ID. Tail color is by far the most important first step as it will help eliminate your search field quite quickly so it brings you down to to a much smaller chunk of bees to look at and then moving on to banding will then um, give you a massive hand in terms of whittling that down further so for example on this slide this picture here we have a red tail and then a lack of banding this is the red tailed bumblebee extremely common species and then these other factors are just really lovely uh, little traits to take a look at that help you figure out gender um, or caste within the species and um, our great little features, uh, interesting features of our bumblebees. So what I'll do is I'll go through each of these and I'll use our most common species as examples as they're the ones that you're most likely to see in your guards if you're getting started with BID. So in terms of tail color, we can put our bumblebees into three broad categories. And there's lots of resources on our website um, in which you can use this feature, this tool interactively to figure out your mystery, what your mystery bee might be. Um, so we've got our white tails as our first category. So this includes an off-white color as well. So for our buff tails, for example. We've got our red tail bumblebees. So these are varying shades of orange and red. And then we've got our ginger and yellow tailed bumblebees. So if we were to look at those handful of common species that I put on one of my first slides, if we were to take a closer look at those, then we could very easily slot those into those tail color categories. So for our white tails, for example, which include off-white or buff, we would put our buff tail. We would put our white tail bumblebee, our tree bumblebee, and the garden bumblebee. So all of those would fit into the white tail category. Then we've got the early bumblebee that we took a closer look at earlier, and the red tail. So both of those would go into the red tail category. And then the common carder, which would go into the yellow or gingery tailed um, category. So even though this is, these aren't all of our bumblebees, these are just um, a handful of some of the most common, but you can see it very quickly 
um, narrows down the number that you need to look at even um, if we were just looking at the, at the most common. So it's then that we could use banding to help us further. So for example, if we were to look at the white-tailed bumblebees, as that's what we have the most of um, on this slide out of these most common. So the buff, the white tail, the tree and the garden. Um, we'll leave for the purpose of um, looking at those that are fairly similar. We'll leave the tree bumblebee out because as you can see, it's quite distinctive in comparison to our other white tails as you have this lovely gingery thorax and then a black band, a good little chunk of black on the abdomen and then a crisp white tail. So it's usually quite distinctive. But we'll take our other white tails and look at how banding can then help for ID. So we've got our buff tail, our white tail, and our garden. So these are our queens, as an example. Our white tail male does look slightly different, has a yellow face. Uh, but we'll use these just as an example. So for our first two, our buff tail and our white tail, which are both very common all over the UK, they, have, they both have two yellow bands in the same position. So for our queen, she has a buff tail. So there's a difference between our queens, but it's harder for our workers um, and the males of our buff tail, which, which have slightly whiter tails. But we can also use not just the number of bands, but the color of them. So for example, the buff tail bumblebee has really orangey yellow um, banding, whereas the white tail bumblebee is lighter those yellow bands are often a very lemony yellow. So that's just an example there of using banding in uh, a species that's very similar. And at first glance, the garden bumblebee here might look very similar to our buff tail and our white tail. But actually, if you take a closer look, we've got three yellow bands rather than two. So we have a collar here, a band at the bottom of the thorax and then one at the top of the abdomen. It can often look like one band because it's split over those two body parts. But if you take a closer look, then you can see that they are two separate bands. And this bee often looks a little bit different as well. It's quite long, I'll show you an image here. And you can see those three bands quite nicely. So taking a closer look, um, you can spot those, some of those features. So as we move then on to some other traits that are um, great ID features, but also just lovely traits for our bumblebees. Uh, one of those is faces. It might seem really um, bizarre and maybe quite detailed to look at a bumblebee's face, but you'll be surprised at how obvious some actually are. And, and that refers to mainly some of our males of the most common species. As I pointed out earlier with the early bumblebee, as you can see here, it has a bright yellow face. And we see that in a few of our males of our most common species. Um, and so another example is the white tailed male as well, which has a lovely bright yellow face. Our males often appear a little fluffier and fuzzier. And it's because once they've emerged, as I mentioned, they leave the nest. Um, they don't return to their to the nest and so they spend the evenings they sleep outside so that extra layer of fluff um, gives them the insulation you'll often find them sleeping underneath leaves or inside flowers um, it's a great thing to to spot um, so that gives them that extra layer of, of warmth so they often have a scruffy and fluffy appearance but also looking at face shape um, it can be really obvious in some, and this one is a particularly obvious specimen, which is the garden bumblebee. So as I mentioned with those three yellow bands and a white tail, it has an extremely long tongue. So it's the length of its whole body. As you can see, it's, it's modeling that for us nicely here, um, which means it has a really long horsey face, as you can see here. Um, so even though uh, a bumblebee's face as a feature might seem a small one, it's often quite obvious. And this is a really nice example of that. 
So this bumblebee loves long tubed flowers like foxgloves, for example, um, because feeding on them with that massive straw like tongue is, is uh, an easy job for this species. So looking at bumblebee legs, which is something I've kind of pointed out already, um, can be really useful to, to help us figure out if we've got a social bumblebee or a cuckoo, for example, as only our social females can collect pollen and nectar in these lovely little pollen baskets. So this is a garden bumblebee worker here, hard at work. So we know that we've got a queen or a worker rather than a male or a cuckoo if they've got these. But once they've collected a good little batch, they've gone back to the nest and they've deposited that food and they've gone out again. What do those lo legs look like without a full pollen basket? Well, they look something like this. So this image here is what that hind leg looks like um, in order to collect that pollen and nectar. So you can see on the, on the hind tibia here on, the, on that back leg, there's a really shiny patch and it often catches the light even more so in queens, which are, are larger, um, so you get a better look at them. So this shiny section is, makes it easier to stick that pollen and nectar to, and they've got these hairs then on either side, which hold that lump in place. Whereas males and cuckoos that don't collect any food, they have much hairier legs uh, because they don't need to create those pollen baskets. So something to, to look out for. So piecing all of these bits together will help you get um, an ID for your bumblebee. As I mentioned, there's loads of resources on our website, loads of printouts and ID guides and our brilliant Introduction to Bumblebees book um, that will help you on your ID journey. The last point on there is behaviour because looking at the way your uh, mystery bee behaves can help figure out whether you've got a queen, a worker or a male because they all act a little differently. For example, at the beginning of the season, our queens that are nest searching, they do this really low flying behavior over the ground. They're investigating all the little nooks and crannies trying to find the perfect nest spot. Whereas now when we've got a lot of workers flying, you'll notice that very quick they're extremely hard workers, very diligently collecting um, and feeding. So they'll be going from flower to flower quite quickly and then back to the nest. And then as we move through the season, our males are a bit more relaxed. Um, they don't collect food for the nest. So sometimes you'll see them having a little relax on a flower. They make great models um, for, uh, for photography. And they... Uh, often patrol as well, create a territory and then patrol looking for queens, so all great behaviour to spot. So taking a closer look at the bumblebee visitors that you might have in your garden um, and recording those uh, in your garden or in your local green space is excellent for, for projects like us. It allows us to gain an insight into where we're finding our bumblebees, but also allows us to take a bigger picture view. And this is particularly important for us as a project, as our project area is home to some really rare and scarce species. And one of those um, is the shrill carder bee. So this um, species is a very special one and has the unfortunate title of being the rarest bumblebee in England. And looking at records historically helps us map out how things have changed for this species and uh, reasons for, for its decline. So the records on this map are pre-2000, the year 2000. So you can see um, a connection there with uh, the south of the UK the majority of the records are. If we then fast forward to 2000 to 2010, then you can see there's been a really dramatic range restriction in those records. And North Kent into the Thames estuary and up into Essex has become a stronghold for this species. 
and hence one of the reasons why our project got started. So how do we figure out if we have a shrill card bee? What do they look like? If you think back to our slide of all of our common species, you'll notice that this one does look very different. It's fairly small bee and has this overall straw pale colour to, um, to the hairs. The lovely distinguishing feature is this black band that runs across the middle of the thorax between the wings. And it also has this little orange rusty tail. So really quite distinguishable um, from a lot of our other bumblebees. Our queens, workers and males all have the same colour pattern for this species. And it gets its name because the buzz of this species is a higher pitch than that of the low drone of a lot of our common species. You can see it feeding here. Never easy to capture footage, as you can imagine. As soon as you take your camera out, they all fly away. So that was a great shot there of our shrill carder. So some of its favourite forage and the plants we try to incorporate then into our management plans, making sure that this bee has the food that it needs. Our bumblebees tend to have a, a wide um, variety of, of forage and plants that they use, but the shrill carder seems to have a particular preference for plants within the dead nettle and the pea family. So here on the far right, you can see it feeding on white dead nettle. And these other two images, you have red dead nettle here and black whorehound. So both really good plants for this species. And then in the pea family, some particular favourites are red clover and common bird's foot trefoil. So we try to make sure um, that we incorporate these plants. These plants are often termed weeds, but actually they're extremely important for a range of pollinators specific, and particularly this rare bumblebee. As we zoom in on the records for Shrill Cardaby in, um, in North Kent, it's no surprise why we chose our project area as it encompasses the majority of um, the Shrill Carder records and sightings. So all of these are submitted through iRecord and this data is absolutely invaluable. It helps us pinpoint locations of, of um, populations of this species. This helps us to focus our conservation work. Bex and Kate can make sure that we're in touch with people within those areas to make sure that there's forage available and great nesting to help support those populations. But also it allows us to take a look at the gaps. So this species, it's thought, doesn't like to travel very far. Research suggests that it stays within about 500 metres of its nest, which you can imagine is an incredibly small space, a very short distance. So some of these gaps are, are too large. So we can then check out those areas and try to create excellent habitat that will allow this bumblebee, this species, to move along the coast and access other areas and create these corridors, which is brilliant then for other bumblebee species, other pollinators, and lots of other wildlife as well. But it's not just I record. Uh, we also have a national recording scheme called Bee Walk. So this is um, a large scale standardized citizen science program. And so you don't need to be in Kent to set one up. You can set up a Bee Walk anywhere. Um, they are um, a consistent, monitoring approach so it's you set up a bee walk you set up a location uh, a set route and you walk that once a month from March to October noting all the bumblebee species that you see you don't have to be an expert to set one up um, it can be a great way to help you learn and get started because we have so many resources to help you um, start that ID journey it means that through this data we get incredible picture of how our bumblebees are doing over time 
So we get an idea of the species that you see on your walk through the seasons and then over the years, which as you can imagine is incredible data. This map shows the bee walks that are in our project area and that have been set up during the time um, that we've been in post and delivering the project. So we've seen a big increase in the number of people taking up bee walks, which is brilliant. And over the last couple of years, we've seen an increase in the number of those bee walks that are recording Shrill Carder. So it's thanks to an increase in recorders that we're able to, to pinpoint those bees and get a lot more information throughout the project area. We're so incredibly grateful to anyone that contributes data to the project, whether that's bee walk or, or ad hoc through iRecord. So if you are thinking about taking a closer look at our bumblebees or hopefully being inspired um, to take uh, a little look at IDing different bumblebees, then getting involved in recording is brilliant. Recording your sightings that are in your garden or your local green space. I record is brilliant uh, for ad, ad hoc one-off records. So great for the garden, for example, or if you're just out and about. And I know BioLinks have done some really brilliant talks on how to use iRecord and we use that data for our project so it's incredibly useful and then you can find out more about our bee walk scheme at beewalk.org.uk and find out how to set one up there's some resources on there um, get an idea of whether that um, scheme could work for you and lots of resources to help you along your way so if you're interested in hearing more about us as a project or as a charity, we're on all the social medias um, and we have a YouTube channel full of little videos that are made by all my brilliant colleagues. Uh, our email is on there as well. If you um, want to get in touch, find out more if you're in Kent and you want to connect with the project. I really hope that there's been something in this for everyone, regardless of where you are on your ID journey whether this is a brand new topic or whether you've done a bit of Bumblebee ID before. I challenge you to take a little closer look at the bumblebees in your garden. Take a perch next to some plants in your garden or stop and have a look at some plants on your walk and take note of the pollinators that arrive. Some might be bumblebees. See if you can pinpoint those differences uh, between the species and just enjoy the beauty of what is some incredible British pollinators. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd be more than happy with the help of my lovely colleagues to, to take any questions that you guys might have. Brilliant, thank you very much, Lauren. That was fantastic. Um, so yeah, as Lauren said, if anyone's got any questions, please go for it. So I'll keep an eye on the chat. I can read out any questions you post in there or raise your hand as we went through before. Let me know. Okay, there's lots of people saying thank you, Lauren, and how brilliant that was. Lots and oh, lots of them. Thank you. Okay, we've got a question from Sue Taylor asking, are the cookie bees as good pollinators as the social bees? Yeah, I think there doesn't seem to be any evidence that there's... Um, a massive difference there they still do a lot of feeding for themselves bumblebees all of them have to feed um every the longest they can go without feeding is 40 minutes that just to power their flight so they'll still be doing a lot of um flower visits uh i think i guess it could be slightly less than that of our workers but i don't think it's enough to have um that large of an impact in terms of pollination effectiveness. Brilliant, thank you. Right, there was another question relating to cuckoos. Um, so Sarah's asked, outside of nesting behaviour, is cuckoo bumblebee behaviour noticeably different to that of non-cuckoo bumblebees? That's a good one. Um, I think on average they um, can appear less busy but I know that Bex has a particular interest in our cuckoo bumblebees. I'm sure she'd be able to elaborate for us. Are you there, Bex? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Brilliant. Um, well, um, yeah, I guess, I mean, 
yeah, you can often sort of get the jizz of a cuckoo bumblebee, I think. Once you're very familiar with the sort of social bees and the way they behave, then yes, I think you can sort of spot, even from a distance, if you're watching a bee flying around, that it's a cuckoo bumblebee. They, they still perform some of that same sort of, especially the females, perform some of that same sort of nest searching behaviour that you see in the social bumblebees. But obviously the cuckoo females are searching for existing nests. So sometimes you might still see them flying low to the ground and then searching out um, nests. Um, some people have reported as well that when they find nests that have been attacked by um, and invaded by cuckoo bumblebees that you sometimes find the dead females uh, close to or maybe just inside the nest so you can sometimes look out for that as well and, um, and at the moment if you look around on your your plants outside you can't fail but to spot male cuckoo bumblebees they are all over the place at the moment and they seem to have almost like a they seem to move in slow motion they kind of got this sort of sluggish sluggish sort of they, they appear like, like a drunk on nectar somehow because <laughs> some of the larger flowers I've got in the garden, you know, some of the scabies and stuff, there's maybe two or three gathered on top and they're just slowly move around, moving around and feeding. So, so yeah, once you, once you kind of get your eye in, you can definitely see some differences in behaviour even before you've got your eye into the differences in the way they look, their morphology and their colouration as well. So, yeah. Yeah, they're great for, photo for photographing those mm. males. <laughs> yeah, they're very variable though. The cuckoos are real. They're a great challenge once you've got grips with all of the sort of easy to identify social bees. Some of the cuckoos can be very different looking, mm -hmm. yeah, even within a species. That's great. Thank you, Bex, for your help with that one. Uh, we've got a question from Mark as well, just asking, uh, have you got any good recommendations for guidebooks for bumblebees? Oh, I do. I have one right here. Oh, yeah, I can see other people holding them up. Thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> yeah, this is the introduction to bumblebees. There aren't a huge amount out there in terms of books as field ID guides. So this is, is a great one. You can find it on our website. Um, and it takes you through a bit about ecology, life cycle, and um, some really good ID pages that provide comparisons with those that are similar so it's a yeah it's a great one to use so have a little look on our website thank you and we've got matt tree uh with your hand up do you want to unmute yourself and ask you a question uh hi just another question about the cuckoos um when they're laying the eggs in the nest is there any like selection on whether it's male or female eggs that they're laying um Oh, then would the male eggs have to be fertilised? I can answer that. On, um, so, so with all of the bees, um, male eggs um, are unfertilised eggs. So male bees result from unfertilised eggs and the females are fertilised. Um, I guess with the cuckoos, they, they're laying both. I mean, I see far more male cuckoo bees around than I do so females but I guess the females when they emerge are pretty much concentrating on finding a bit of food and then finding somewhere safe to hide away and hibernate so maybe it's the males that are sort of just hanging around more. I don't actually know in terms of whether it's an equal amount of males and females that, that they're laying but, um, but they're definitely laying both if that's your question. Yeah I was just wondering if it was like an equal ratio or... Oh, I see. Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm afraid. It looks like you're about to show us some bumblebees now. You look like you're out and about in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very nice. <laughs> I don't see any around me at the moment. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, someone we... else on the call might, might know if, about the ratios, but, um, but I'm not sure off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Yeah, neither do I. No problem. Can't know everything. <laughs> Uh, we've got a question from Helen as well, asking what's going to happen to the project this year after it's finished? We are still working on it at the moment. Um, we hope to put some plans in place and there will hopefully still be a Bumblebee Conservation Trust presence in Kent um, come the end of the project. But um, it's all still still in the in the planning, as is the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough <laughs> I guess so one of the things that we've been focusing on so much throughout the whole project and not just this year is, is the, as Lauren mentioned earlier the importance of volunteers we've got some really great well-trained volunteers now who know loads about bumblebees they're able to go out and identify them some of them are starting to do talks and walks and that sort of thing so even if we're gone 
there's a lovely team of people who are continuing the good work. Yeah. yeah. Great stuff. Um, we had a question from Jenny as well, just asking how many social B types are there in the UK? So um, we have 24 in total, so that's 18 social and six cuckoos. Brilliant, thank you. Bear with me a second, I'm just reading through. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Okay, so we've got another question about cuckoos, lots about these. There's, uh, <laughs> would a cuckoo bee get into a tree bumblebee nest and laying egg? Or would the bees then try and remove the eggs laid? So as in, would, would, do they try and remove the cuckoo eggs or do they not know that they're... Do they, yeah, I don't know, I'm sure Best go again. Will, yeah, yeah, because um, I know they, they get, <coughs> they can try and remove the female and um and a fight can yeah. occur but eggs i'm not sure what you think the the kind of the process of um a cuckoo bumblebee kind of invading and um subduing a host nest can be quite a long process so once a cuckoo's found a, a host nest which is at the right stage for her to invade she wants it so that it's got plenty of workers so that there'll be enough to rear her own brood but not so many that when she attempts to overtake it that they'll overcome her um, and actually there can be a succession of different sort of, of battles of bees trying to take over a nest and occasionally the cuckoo will be killed and sometimes the host queen will be killed and there'll be yeah so there can sometimes be more than one um, a sort of cuckoo female that's tried to take over a nest and other ones will come in afterwards and try and take over as well so yes yeah, so it can be quite a long process it can take a, a few weeks as well so sometimes she'll hang around close to the nest before she's and then sort of Kind of gradually infiltrate before she'll finally take over her take over and start laying her own eggs um so yeah so the workers do attack her um and then in terms of um destroying eggs and stuff i think um, there probably is a, a little bit of that but actually what happens is the cuckoo destroys young eggs and pupae of the host but tends to obviously all the existing workers remain to um, rear her brood and any um, more mature um, pupae of the host as well. The cuckoo uh, female leaves as well because she wants to have plenty that will develop into workers to rear her own brood. So yeah, there's there's all sorts of kind of battles and war and death and destruction that goes on when when cuckoos take over over nests. Yeah, <laughs> and egg destruction and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, did that answer the question? <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's mad. I didn't realise there were many battles going on. Yeah, <laughs> warfare, bumblebee yeah. warfare. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so, sorry, can I can I just say it was it was me that asked the question on the on the the tree bumblebee because oh, we have I didn't, didn't realise you meant I didn't I didn't realise you specifically meant tree bumblebee, sorry. Yeah, we we'll have a that. tree bumblebee nest in our bird box. Mm -hmm. And there seem to be these birds uh, bees doing like a figure of eight and they keep flying ah. around, around the nest. Yeah, so that's a different behaviour. So yeah. um in the UK know. at the moment, because the tree bumblebees are relatively new um newcomer to the uk it actually doesn't have um a cuckoo bumblebee associated with it so most of the cuckoo bumblebees have associated either a single host or maybe two or three closely related species but the tree bumblebee doesn't have one and that behavior that you're talking about there with bees flying outside the box and maybe doing a figure of eight and sometimes in a small group as well is actually um, the behavior of the males so males will come and gather outside a nest and they'll almost perform a tiny little like people call it like a swarming behavior but it's not but they'll gather outside waiting for new queens to emerge and yeah. it's just males it's waiting just, to be the first this is just single bees doing this flying round oh okay and is it is it bees that look like the tree bumblebee as well oh, they look very they look, similar they do, uh, i i tried yeah to maybe <laughs> they yeah. so, fast yeah the other thing that um, that they do as well is bees, are, they do kind of an orientation flight as well. And often yeah. that can see a series of sort of figure eights or small circles as they're familiarising themselves with what their home looks like. And gradually that, that um, sort of figure of eight will get larger and larger as they recognise other features. And I've noticed that sometimes if I go and stand next to a bumblebee nest, all of a sudden I'm a new feature in the landscape. 
And so mm. sometimes they do a reorientation flight quite close to your head sometimes as they're sort of getting used to this new object and then sort of off they go and they, they yeah, know I've, I've they had get. them flying around my round me. Yeah, well. it's yeah, they, usually an ori orientation thing. Yeah, yeah, I ask about the the egg because I thought one of these that had been flying around mm. got into the nest because they, they do seem to be there stopping them. Uh -huh. And then a few minutes later it came well, seconds later it came out, and then another one came out with something white in its and oh. flew off with it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, if that was an egg. <laughs> That's why yeah. I asked. Do I don't know. I did get a picture of this eggs. thing with the white, so I don't know whether it's an egg or not. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, it's okay. There's, but yeah, there's all these different behaviours that it could, could possibly be. Yeah, mm. but no, there's no no cuckoo known at the minute associated with the tree bumblebees. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> In the UK. Thank you. Thank you. Got a question from Damien asking how response. Uh, I'm sorry. How responsive do you feel landowners have been to the idea of pollination services as a motivator to change some of their land management practices? Yeah, really, we've had a really positive response. I'm sure Kate would love to say a bit on that because I know, because Kate works with a huge range of different landowners and it's been nothing but good, isn't it? Yeah, we've had a really positive experience. Um, a lot of the time we don't have to contact the landowners ourselves, they get in contact with us. We are inundated with um, farmers. Yeah. I work specifically a lot of the time with orchard owners. Um, they've been really responsive. Um, they um, aren't, they can't be part of the agri-environment scheme to so get funding for certain um, environmental practices they put on um, their sites. Um, so getting involved with us is completely off their own backs and it's been really positive. Um, it works sort of two ways. It helps them with pollination services, so improves the quality and the yield at their, on their orchards and um, also uh, it can reduce the maintenance of their farms. So. They don't have to cut as much and also it looks really nice but we've had such a positive um response and it's only been good really that's great good to know okay we've got another question from rachel asking is it uh still useful to start a bee walk survey now having missed march april and may yeah definitely you can start it any time Obviously, it's important to note that at the moment, with current restrictions, we're advising uh, bee walks just in England at the moment until things change again in Wales and Scotland, where you can venture further afield. Um, so it's good to keep that in mind, and obviously social distancing and whether the area you want to walk is available for you to walk in, uh, whether it's a reserve or, or an area that might be closed off. So keeping those things in mind, but. Um, it doesn't matter when in, in the year that you start your bee walk. So any time is, is great and, um, and you don't have to be an expert. So yeah, get out there looking and take some resources with you. And it's surprising how quickly you'll, you'll pick it up, especially those, those common seven or eight. Great stuff. Uh, we've got a question from Rob. He said, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm looking to encourage bee habitat in local woodland. What would be the best way to do this? Woodland is trickier. Kate, oh, you've unmuted. Have you got yeah, some so insight? Woodland is slightly different. Um, we don't necessarily think of woodland habitat being synonymous with bumblebees, but they do use woodland quite a lot. They'll use canopy woodland to travel through, um, through the landscape, but also they use uh, glades and rides through woodland, so sunnier patches that have opened up that are brilliant for nesting, so if there's tusky grass, and for forage. Um, so either keeping blades and rides open, so you're still getting that sun in and having those, um, those mixtures of uh, uh, lots of different floristic diversity, or opening up areas um, for creating smaller rides and glades through um, uh, traditional habitat management techniques, such as um, coppicing. Um, woodland edge is really important too. Um, so really we just want to encourage lots of different flowering species um, that we find in woodland. So there's lots of options. Um, uh, I've gone a bit blank now. Um, some of our dead nettles, some of our, um, our wound works are really good. Um, arch angel, there's loads of different um, native woodland species that you can encourage in the sunnier patches that bumblebees will feed on. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got a question from... Sue saying, I noticed a white-tailed bee, I guess that means, uh, on the leaves of my plum tree. It looked like it was feeding off maybe the sugar from the aphids. Would that be correct? 
Yeah, this isn't something that I knew of until very recently when we, we was being sent a lot of photos of this behavior. Um, yeah, it seems like they are. Bex, you're nodding. They are, I'm guessing yeah, they are using the energy of the, of the sugary yeah. product. They'll take a sugary meal wherever they can. If you imagine that, you know, some people feed them like sugary water, it's the same. It's just a, it's a little pool of available sugar. So, yeah, if they come across a, a leaf that's covered in a bit of, sort of aphid, I don't know what the term is, but yeah, sugar uh, aphid residue. Yeah, they'll yeah. use the, it's called insufloral nectaries on the plants as well. So you might see them yeah, feed yeah. a random bit of a plant and there's no yeah. aphid around, but there's there's a, a nectar producing areas on plants. Yeah, you, nectaries, yeah, yeah. yeah, you wouldn't really yeah. know. I've seen them feeding in areas around aphids, yeah, licking, lapping up the pollen, and pollen <laughs> nectar even. Opportunistic, I'll, t I'll yeah. take it, food anywhere. <laughs> Brilliant, okay, we're going to have to finish up soon, so I'm going to read one more question out. I'm very sorry everyone, I know there's lots of questions in the chat, I have been trying to keep on top of them, um, so I, I'm just going to pick a random one I think, because I'm not going to be able to get through all of them. Um, Okay, so there's one from Lorna asking, do bumblebees uh, suffer badly from the use of pesticides and weed killers? So, yeah, this is a good question. We do, we um, get this a lot. Obviously, because there's a huge different range of herbicides and pesticides, their effects can be very different. Um, and there's a lot of research that goes into figuring out the effects um, on pollinators, not just bumblebees, of these different types. An example would be neonicotinoids, um, which after extensive research found that um, it affected the neural pathways of bumblebees. So it didn't um, kill them necessarily straight away from ingesting, but it meant they, they became permanently lost and confused and unable to find their way back to the nest, uh, which of course then uh, is to the detriment of that nest and it, and it might not go on to produce queens. So that's just one example. So of course, um, all the different types of, of insecticides and herbicides will, will affect pollinators in lots of different ways. So yeah, as a whole, of course, we would encourage people to, to refrain from, from using things like that in their gardens and think about gardening um, organically uh, where, wherever possible to look after. Not just, our, not just pollinators, but the whole system. Yeah, of course. Brilliant. Right. Well, it's just past quarter past now, so we're going to bring this to an end, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm sure you'll thank Lauren, too, for a fantastic talk. And thanks to Kate and to Bex as well for helping with the questions at the end. It's been lots of useful information today. Really um, great questions. Thank you all. If you want to unmute yourselves as well to say bye, it's quite weird talking to a quiet screen. <laughs> be lovely. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thanks so much. Well, Thank, Thank you. you.